Hey guys. Um, so sad story. I recorded this lecture last night and I forgot to turn the sound on. So there's 45 minutes of a screen with important information on it, but no audio to go with it. So we're going to redo this again. It's all good. Uh, we'll do a better job this time. All right. All right. So before we get going, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, but before we get going, I want to show you something in Canvas. So let me share this screen. This is the slideshow that we're going to use today. Uh, I just need to exit this. So I'm going to show you something on Canvas. So let's go to home. And what I've done, and maybe you saw this or maybe you missed it. I just recently did this after I recorded the first two lecture videos. But I took the lecture videos. And if you don't like clicking on a link and putting a password in, you can go and view them on YouTube. And I have them embedded in here. You just click the link and it takes you to the YouTube video. Okay. So those are, you know, that's like also think about um, think about this. Like if you are unable to, if the password's not working and it's late at night and you're like, oh my gosh, I only have like two hours to do this. Um, you can always say, okay, you know what? I'll just default to the YouTube videos. So that's what I wanted to show you guys. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at the biology genes and natural selection. So we've got our note sheet handy and we'll click our link that takes us to our slides. And then I'm just going to click the link on the top to open them up at the slide page itself on my Google drive. Okay. All right, as soon as it loads up, we'll go ahead and get started. So what I really want you guys to walk away from this video, this, this video is sort of special in, in a way because it's a comprehensive but very succinct look at what biology has come to discover about the history of life on this planet. Um, it's also a very concise way of looking at the fundamental architecture of life and then also uh how that or how life was able to change and rapidly i mean rapid is kind of a subjective term but how life was able to diversify and become all of the various life forms that you see um but also how they're also similar in that they use the same software code the DNA and RNA. And so it's really a, it's really going to be this short lesson, um, but it gives you the essentials, like the essential nuts and bolts of the function of biology and evolution. And so it's kind of a special little presentation. So you're not going to find this material exactly in the E-Stax book. It won't line up perfectly, but it's a good short intro into the kind of stuff that we're going to look at throughout the semester. Cool. All right. So what is biology? Biology is the study of life. We know that. And so what does that actually mean? Well, that means that we can look at how chemistry comes together and chemistry is governed by physics and the laws of physics. And so we can look at the layers of life and the layers of complexity and how they're kind of like um, Russian dolls. And so the innermost layer would be your uh, physics, and then the next one would be your chemistry and how chemistry, how physics informs the chemistry, and then how the chemistry forms the microscopic processes of living things like enzyme reactions, DNA replication, uh, DNA molecules themselves, proteins, carbohydrates, fats, and how all of these molecules um, come together in an organic way to create the fundamental units of life like cells. And so we can look at how cells sustain themselves using chemistry, how they communicate with each other using chemistry. Um, and then we can also look at another Russian doll out is we look at how cells that are a similar type. So like liver cells or, or kidney cells or cardiac cells, how they organize themselves into tissues and how tissues are a set of cells that can be working together to perform a general function and how tissues organize themselves into organs and organ systems become and sustain the entire package or the entire organism. And that's if we're talking about a multicellular organism because single cells, they don't organize themselves into tissues. Um, all right, and then from there we can look at 
um, once you have the organism itself that's sustained by these organs and organ systems, then you can look at the interactions between members of the sink species, whether it's trees, whether it's birds, whether it's reptiles or mammals like us. Um, we can look at how they interact with each other, how they communicate, how they reproduce with each other, um, and how those interactions influence the survival and reproductive needs of each individual organism, each individual tree, plant, bush, shrub, alligator, um, bird, mammal, you name it. And then uh, another layer out is, okay, that was just individuals of the same species and how they interact with each other. But we could say, okay, how do members of that species interact with members of other species? And how, you know, how does the tree play a role in the life cycle of the bird and things like that? And that whole look at that ecosystem is another layer. And then finally, and, and I guess in, in, in a essence there, we're talking about because you have an organism like a bird and we talk about the external factors like external um, other organisms like the tree that the bird lives on the hawk that hunts the bird or the snake that hunts the bird or the water source for the bird or the food source for the bird you know which is probably like some sort of insect and so how all of these things in a very complex way interact to shape the trajectory of how that bird's genome will change over the course of evolution to better adapt the next generation to handle the environment that it's placed in. Um, and so what, what do we really mean by that? So what are we going to be looking at? Sorry, I actually duplicated this slide and it put all the animations in, but I wanted it to be like, pow, we're going to look at two of those. We're going to look at two of those Russian dolls in this course. And so we're going to look primarily um, at the beginning of the course, we're going to look at the chemistry and how um, basic molecular chemistry helps to build more complex organic molecules and how those organic molecules organize themselves into cells. All right. And then we won't look at the organization of tissues into organs and organ systems, but we will zoom out after that and look at the organism and the population. So we'll kind of go between conspecifics in a way. We'll look at population genetics because you can't really understand how evolutionary works in a long-term way unless you understand the dynamics of populations. And so we'll look at those that stuff at the end of the semester. Um, and so what do all of these things have in common? Well, um, they all, what all life forms and all these layers of, um, complexity, if you will, have in common is that they've all been shaped by a process called natural selection. Now, natural selection is an interesting concept. Natural selection is actually an explanation for how things change, how things change or how organisms change, right? So natural selection is the biological process that explains why organisms have slowly and incrementally over a long period of time gain complexity over countless generations. Why, did, why does life steadily improve generation to generation to generation? And natural selection provides a mechanism, an explanatory mechanism for why organisms would gradually improve or what appears to be improvement or a gain of complexity over many, 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 many generations. Um, and so when we talk about the beginning of life on this planet, we're talking about RNA. Now, RNA, we haven't talked about it obviously yet, but it uh, is a type of biological molecule that contains code, but also works in a functional way. So you may have heard of DNA, and DNA is pretty popularized by this point, so most people have heard of DNA. And RNA is a photocopy of DNA which gives the illusion that DNA was first and that RNA came second. That's not how it works, though. Early, early on in the early life, RNA was the first and primary operator. Now, RNA is a duplicate or a copy of DNA, but it has its own sort of, what's the word, building blocks that it's made out of. And the, the, the building blocks that RNA is made out of has a couple of different functions. One of them is that it can store information on how to make like a physical product, or you could look at it this way, an RNA will store the information like a code, like a computer code on how to 
produce a software program and the software program is functional, right? That's what interacts with the user, but it's the code is the RNA. And so when you have these self-replicating bits of code that were also one of the second parts of RNA's function is that RNA can actually engage, like the molecule itself can engage in the process of replication. And it can also engage in the process of building proteins or building the software. So it's kind of crazy. RNA has a couple of different things that it can do. It can help to store information on how to build a software program. It can help to translate that code into the software program, and it can help to replicate the code itself. And so once you've met those three criteria, um, as soon as RNA becomes self-replicating, all you got to think is if a mutation takes place, which is a change in the sequence of code in that RNA strands, as soon as that mutation takes place, it changes the function of the software that's produced. And if that change is more beneficial to the survival and replicative abilities of that RNA strand, well, then that RNA strand is going to copy itself better. It's going to survive better than other RNA copies that are like it. And then you have gradual improvement. That's, that's in essence what natural selection is. You have gradual improvement um, over generation. And a generation is just a replication in this case when you're talking about RNA. Um, and so these RNA molecules almost three and a half billion years ago started to self-replicate and the mutations created variations between these molecules. And then you have competitive replication and the struggle to acquire resources like energy to continue your replicate replicative um, function. And that led to increased um, complexity in the replicators themselves. Okay. And so how did all that become this crazy abundance of life that we see today? Because that's just a strand of RNA. That's a tiny little molecule that's self-replicating that led eventually to all of this. Um, and so through a process of mutation, which adds variation, and a process of selection where the different variants are selected from and the ones that survive better and re replicate better stay behind and leave more copies of um, things like themselves, then you have this process of um, gradual complexification over many, many, many generations. So variation, competitive replication, and then reduction of inferior types. And so the better the replicating vessel, so once you're making cells, once you're making um, multicellular things, once you can think about those as being the vessel of the replicators of the RNA, um, and the more offspring it leaves behind through that competitive replication, endowed with the same betterness of replicating abilities, then you have gradual complexification over many, many, many millions and millions and billions of years. It's almost unfathomable how long this planet has been around. So I have a love-hate relationship with this guy. His name is Richard Dawkins, and he is a dick. It's Dick Dawkins, but no, really, he is kind of a jerk. Um, but that doesn't just because I don't like somebody doesn't mean that what they say isn't true. And so here they are in you and me, or they are in you and me. They created us, their body and mind, and their preservation is the ultimate rationale for our existence, meaning preserving them and replicating them. They've come a long way, those replicators. They go by the name of genes. Genes are the primary replicators. You know, he wrote a book called The Selfish Gene, and we are their survival machines. So he has a very like artistic way, colorful way of looking at it. Um, but in the same way, it's almost like myopic saying like, oh, a gene is selfish. But it also kind of helps you to understand if you think about genes being selfish and trying to acquire more resources. And when they do that, they can they have more energy to replicate themselves more. And so you have this idea of a selfish gene. He kind of takes that idea of evolution and puts that coloring on it. Um, but he's kind of a jerk. Okay, so let's jump into the difference between phenotype and genotype, because these are important. Now, it seems like we're kind of switching gears here. We were just talking about genes, and the word up here that looks familiar is genotype, and that's what genotype is. We're talking about what sort of genes somebody has or what sort of alleles they carry. Now, we can look at the phenotype as the software product of the genotype. So I'm using this analogy where 
genotype or genes or alleles and things of that nature, stuff that is structurally DNA and RNA. That is the software code. So that's my analogy. And then this, the, the actual software program itself that is generated from the code that the user, user interfaces with, that's the phenotype. So that could be things like physical characteristics. You know, that is the functional product of the genotype. So we're looking over here, a gene, a, a gene is a sequence of nucleotides that codes for a functional product. Holy crap, I just noticed something. <laughs> I put the wrong definition. That's the definition of a gene is a sequence of nucleotides that codes for a functional product. But a genotype is a particular set of alleles that an individual carries. That's genotypes. Let me jump back in here. Um, all right, so the genotype is the particular set of alleles that an individual carries. Okay, and we'll talk about alleles in a second. So there is a there is an analog. The phenotype is an analog of the genotype, meaning the genotype is the code. The phenotype is dependent upon the code, but the phenotype is what interacts with the environment. It in interacts with the user. The user chooses the best software that they like to interface with. And so the user itself in this analogy is like natural selection. So it's going to pick the best software programs that suit its needs, right? Or vice versa, however you want to look at it. Um, and that would be the phenotype, natural selection acting on the phenotype. So when we think about phenotypes, we should think about physical things like traits, like humans have traits. We have hair, we have ears, eyes, forward facing eyes, nose, mouth. We have heart followed by, you know, we have all of these traits and those are all generally shared by 99.9% .9 of humans. The reason we all share these traits is because we all have the same genes. We do. We all have the same genes. The genes are the code for the traits. It's, it's very generic. So when we go from genes and traits and we go down to alleles and trait forms, we're going from generic to specific. When we go genotype, phenotype, we're talking generically, what is their genotype? What is their phenotype? And then as we go deeper, we say, okay, what, what traits do they have? Because phenotype is like the physical characteristic. What traits do they have? And the traits would be something like, well, they have eyes, they have arms, they have fingers, they have toes, they have skin. And it's the code is the genes. The genes code for those traits. Now, not all genes are the same. Any variation in a gene, so it's, it's the gene is coding. It's a chunk of code that codes for a particular software program. But if that gene's code gets changed a little bit, it's still, it's still the same gene, but that new code is a little bit different. And that might code for a slightly different software program. So if you're into coding or something, I'm, I'm not, so I'm going to totally butcher this. But if you have a code that's written for a dialog box, if you change a little bit of that code, that dialog box may shrink, it may expand. And so the idea is that everyone all has the same genes, but we all have different alleles. We have different codes of the same genes. So our dialog boxes are all a little bit different. Our, our, our software programs are all a little bit different. And so that's what I want you to walk away from this with. Alleles are the specific variant that somebody has of a gene. And the trait form is the manifestation of that variant. Okay. So variation is the key in this aspect. The genotype is a particular set of alleles an individual carries. An allele is a population-wide variation of nucleotide sequence of the same gene. That's a mouthful, but it's basically saying variations in the code of the same gene. And so we have examples like some people have um, brown eyes, some people have blue eyes. Those are variations of the eye trait. A gene generally is just a sequence of nucleotides that codes for a functional product. Now that could be a protein, it could be RNA, um, but whatever it is, it's something that is interfacing with the environment itself. So even if you're producing an enzyme that's inside of a cell, there's still an environment that that enzyme is exposed to. And if that cell is in warmer temperatures or colder temperatures, that will, that will change 
the ability of that enzyme to function or change its functionability, if you will, right? So the environment still plays a role, a big role in how well proteins do, tiny little proteins inside your cell. You can also look at them like bigger things, like how how well do, um, do two hands serve you? Okay, well, we have genes that code for having two hands, um, and that's a functional product. Specifically, how long are your fingers and how big are your hands? That would be a consequence of what alleles you have, what different variations of the genes or the code itself. Now, phenotype, we said earlier, is the physical characteristics. And so when we're talking generally, we're talking genes are analogs to traits. So genes is the code, trait is the software program or the dialog box. And then trait form is the allele or it's the, it's the product, the physical product of the allele or the software product from the code, um, the variation in that code. Okay. So if you consider this, the more variation you have in a population, and, we're, and the only way you have variation is if you have different alleles. Because if everyone has the same genes and the same alleles, we would all look exactly the same. So the only way that selection can do its job is if we all have different variations of the same genes. Then it can choose the best phenotypes that are fittest and do the best reproductively, and then those get passed on to the next generation. And so that's how it works. So what is evolution? Well, evolution is a change in allele frequency or proportion in a population over generational time, from generation to generation. So if I go out in the human population and I say, okay, what, at what proportion is there the blue-eyed allele in our populations? And I could count that. I could go out and sample people, do genetic studies on them, figure out what their alleles are. And then I can say, okay, what proportion of all alleles in our population are made up of blue-eyed alleles? And then if I let a few generations go by and I come back, and for, you know, maybe in a time machine, 100 years later, after a few generations, I could go out and sample it again. And if that allele proportion, if the blue-eyed proportion in the proportion of all uh, eye color alleles has changed in its proportion, it's gotten bigger or smaller, then evolution has happened in that population. And that's what we mean. And so typically when we refer to evolution, we're referring to how species change through time. And the definition of a species is a group of potentially interbreeding organisms that can produce viable offspring. So you have horses, you have donkeys, they can reproduce, but the product of the reproduction, the offspring, the mule is inviable it cannot reproduce and so the horse and donkey lineages stop right there they don't blend together and so they remain separate excuse me separate species um, a population is a subset of a species that lives in a particular geographic area so you can have the same species of bird living in europe as you do in north america they might even be able to interbreed and create viable offspring even though maybe they don't cross paths anymore but we would say those are two different populations because the climate and the environment in Europe is different than the climate and environment in North America. And as we know, the climate and environment is what's going to pressure the, the gene pools of each one of those populations to adapt to that environment. And so if they're exposed to two different environments, then the species are changing in two different directions. They're aiming at two different targets, if you will. And so that's why we say population. So you can say, how do we estimate allele frequency? Well, we can go out and we can sample. Let's say we're interested in eye color. I can go out and sample people, take their DNA, and I can see what alleles they have for eye color. And then I can check and, and, and count up all of the alleles that I've sampled and say what proportion of them in that population are, you know, brown eye, blue eyed, green eye, that sort of thing. Um, so anyways, let's see. How do allele frequencies change. There's two ways that allele frequencies change, two ways that, that uh, evolution takes place. One way is through natural selection. Um, and so we'll talk about that in a little bit in more detail. But selection is sort of like the different survival and reproductive successes of individuals or groups that exhibit the best phenotypes for their particular environment. And that's what I was talking about with North America and uh, Europe is that selection in those environments, natural selection is equivalent or identical with quote unquote, the environment. It's not like some like angel standing over animals with a sword, whacking people down randomly. It's the environment, which it constitutes everything that an organism is exposed to is going to challenge that organism in its survivability and in its ability to find a mate and reproduce. 
And so that is selection is it's, it's the challenge of the phenotype to reproduce itself. And when it does that, it passes on certain genes and alleles. And then if it's, if it has a certain combination of alleles and genes that works out best, then it generally leaves behind more of those copies for the next generation. And then the allele frequencies gradually shift toward that particular phenotype that was best suited for that environment. Oh, I know it's a lot, right? It's super deep. <laughs> and so, like we say, natural selection acts directly on the phenotype and the environment is natural selection. And the interesting thing about that is that the environment is never stable. If it was, we would all assimilate into a certain phenotype that worked out and we would have never evolved past like a freaking octopus. Okay. So now we're at the point where we, we have adapted to a changing environment through generations and millions of years to the point where we are today, where we have opposable thumbs, right? Where we have um, no facial hair except beards, which are weird. Uh, and, and here, hold on, I'm going to get my kids to be quiet. All right. Um, the other process, and it's not your note sheet, but we'll talk about it in unit four um, that affects allele frequencies is this idea of genetic drift is that sometimes a meteor hits a population and takes out, you know, a certain proportion of alleles. Maybe it takes out, or, you know, sometimes like, um, like a family of ducks, like ends up dying or something. And so they all had shared the same alleles because they're a family. And so when, you know, when they die out in a particular pop population or a particular ecosystem, that changes the allele frequencies. But it wasn't because you know, it wasn't because it got eaten. It wasn't because it got eaten by, you know, an alligator or something. Maybe they just got cold or something and died, or maybe there was a, a random frost or something and that happened. Um, sometimes it also happens if you have founder effects. So you have a population of people, a bunch of different alleles, you know, people, especially familial groups share a lot of alleles. And if one of those familial groups picks up and leaves and goes somewhere, well, then they're carrying all their unique alleles with them and so that changes the original population's allele frequencies and then also when they start a new population now that new population has an abundance or a bigger proportion of the alleles that they're starting it with that they left with okay all right so in order for natural selection to do its jobs we got three qualifying factors and then that's it this is all we're talking about so Natural selection can only work if these three things are met, okay? The trait form, right? That's the, th that's the physical characteristics that's, that's produced by the variant allele, like the allele that is a different variation of the gene. So the trait form is like the software program, like the unique software program or the unique dialog box, if you will. So it must be varied relative to other trait forms of the same species. So if the dialog box created is all the same, well, then there's no way for the user to interface or to choose from those dialog boxes which one it prefers. You have to have variation in the trait form itself. And that comes from variation in the alleles themselves. Okay. The second part, I'm like, clean your fingers. Okay. All right, the trait. All right, the second component of selection is that the trait form, so has to be able to be inherited. It has to be um, passed on in a replicated sense. Like it has to be, it has to be passed on through the alleles, through the bloodline, through the germline to the next generation because if that trait form is working out and it's great and it helps that individual survive but it's not coded for in the genes it doesn't make it into the next generation so the next generation suffers because they don't they don't receive that beneficial phenotype or that beneficial trait form in the next generation um, so the alleles have to vary and the trait forms have to vary the trait forms have to be heritable you have to be able to pass them on from parent to offspring um, and then finally, the trait form itself has to provide the person carrying it or the individual plant or animal, or whatever, it has to provide that individual with the ability to out survive or out reproduce and leave behind more offspring that are also able to out survive and out reproduce other individuals with different trait forms. 
So there's a fitness aspect that's called fitness. How well, how well are you adapted to your environment? How well are your trait forms that you carry the variety of different trait forms adapted to that environment that you're exposed to? And if it's better than the other trait forms around you, chances are you're going to out survive them out reproduce them and leave behind more copies. And so all right, so sorry about the interruptions. Hopefully I nipped them pretty quickly. So um, anyways, I mean, that's kind of like the nature of this, right? Like all the kids are at home. My wife's at school right now. She's the headmaster of North Phoenix Prep. So I have the kids at home until school is open. So that's just the nature of the environment uh, that we're in, the selective environment. Say we're doing pretty well. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. It was about a 30-minute lecture. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email or a text. I'd be happy to answer them. Until next time, I'll see you later.